Hi. Today I want to go through some of the key ideas of Chapter 5. Chapter 5 uh, is a very important chapter. It deals with uh, consumer credit. Um, one reason I think it's so important is it seems to me that it's likely that this chapter in many ways is the issue right now in your life that gets college-age students and, and recent college graduates most in trouble. Um, and in my view, credit card debt is bad news. And one thing I hope you take from this class and you're able to, to, to use as you move forward is that you need to make it a, a really a big priority to avoid credit card debt. And let me emphasize, I'm not saying that credit cards are bad news. In fact, credit cards are a tremendous resources, resource, as I will discuss, um, and I use a credit card probably every day. Uh, I think credit, credit cards are super convenient and useful. But credit card debt, and that is the idea of not paying off your credit card full every month, is what gets you into serious financial trouble. Um, credit cards have a lot. A lot of it, of conveniences and advantages. Um, I would be, I, I, you know, surprised if you don't use a credit card already, and will continue to use a credit card. In the world we live in, um, it's pretty difficult uh, it, to engage in a lot of economic transactions unless you have a credit card. Credit cards are really convenient when you're shopping. You don't need to walk around with a pocket full of bills. Um, you just have a credit card. Um, credit cards also provide a record of expenses. So you'll get a report at the end of every month of what you purchased. If, as I hope you will do at least for some period of your time in your, in your life, as you're trying to get your spending in line with your income, this ability for credit card statements um, to show you and help you keep track of what you've purchased over the course of each month is really convenient. Uh, credit cards make it very easy to return merchandise. In fact, credit cards in many circumstances provide more protection for you than if you purchased for thing, things in cash. And that is the big credit card companies, uh, when you have a problem with your product that you've purchased, will stand behind you and help you get uh, either a, uh, a, a, the, the, the company that sold you the product to credit you back for the defective item or, in fact, correct it and resolve the problem and send you an item that's not defective. So... Um, the idea uh, that credit cards give you protection and that they're safer than carrying cash. Um, if you happen to lose your wallet or your purse, it's happened to me, it's happened to my wife, it's probably happened to many people that you know. If you have cash, you can pretty much write it off. You're never going to see the cash again. However, if you have a credit card, you can call your credit card company and have your credit card frozen and have almost essentially zero liability for loss. Now, it's a real pain to lose your credit cards or wallet, but um, if you lose cash, and let's suppose you were walking around because you don't want credit cards and you're doing Christmas shopping and you have $500 in your purse, you'd lose all $500 if you lost your, your purse. Um, and if you have a credit card, uh, you will have essentially zero liability uh, if you've lost it. Uh, credit cards um, are needed to make reservations, to do car rentals, to do most shopping online. Now, yes, you can use PayPal. Uh, PayPal, in many ways, is, is like a debit card. It's usually linked to your, uh, uh, your banking account, um, but you need some way to pay for the item. Credit cards are the most common. Uh, another reason why credit cards are attractive is many credit cards, including ones that have zero annual payments, um, give you rebates, that is cash back or airline miles or some other forms of bonuses like free gasoline or things like that. Um, and those are nice. They basically uh, give you a bonus uh, for purchasing with the credit card. And I think really underrated by most people is that the credit card, your responsible use of a credit card, allows you to build your credit score. And the idea of a credit score is introduced in this chapter, and I'm going to talk about it in this presentation. Credit score 
and a good credit score can have a huge impact on your uh, finances. Um, that being said, as convenient as credit cards are, let me stress, uh, danger, danger. Uh, uh, if I had a dollar for each person that I've known that at some point succumbed to the temptation of the credit card, which is, it seems like all of a sudden you have somebody, a bank, who's willing to give you a $3,000 credit line, and that allows you to purchase new clothes, uh, do car repair, buy books. The idea that you all of a sudden have a bunch of money, it the reaction of many people is it's like free money. And in fact, it's the opposite of free money. It's extremely expensive money to use a credit card as a loan device that is not paying them off every month. Credit card interest rates, uh, again, it depends on your particular credit card, but it easily can range to 15% to 18% per month. That's not unusual at all. When you realize that right now a savings account is giving you less than 1% or approximately 1% and a credit card is charging you 15% for the loan, you realize how expensive credit cards are. And this challenge of, of, of paying back your credit card um, really creates a long-term financial problem. Um, if you pay the minimum amount on your credit card, it will take you months and months, years and years to pay off the, the credit card. Um, and as a result, if you overspend on your credit card, it will tie up your future income. You will have to pay off the credit card at some point. Credit card, when you don't pay them off every month, effectively you're taking, a, it's a super convenient form of a loan. But the problem is these credit card loans cost are real money and they are way, way more costly than paying with cash. If you use credit cards, you easily can pay triple uh, the price of the item and the, and the extra charges are all the interest you pay. And credit cards are very expensive unless you pay them off every month. We take a step back. There, there are two types of loans, consumer credit loans that you might get. One are called closed in credit. The other is open in credit. Uh, it's the open in credit are the ones that tend to get um, uh, people in trouble. What's closed in credit? A closed in credit uh, is sometimes called installment loans. You might have heard of that term. You can think of it as like when you get a house mortgage or let's say you get a, uh, a five-year loan when you purchase a car or perhaps you've worked out a loan, some uh, places that sell furniture or appliances um, will actually loan you the money in the form of an installment credit. Um, these are basically one-time loans, and that is you get a loan from, say, Toyota or maybe your savings uh, uh, bank um, to purchase a car. It's, it's a specific use, and they'll say, okay, here's $15,000 or here's $9,000, and it's specifically earmarked to allow you, say, to purchase a car. Or obviously, in the case of a home, it'll be a larger amount. But these are loans that closed in credit are, for, are fixed amounts for specified periods of time. Um, it's a traditional loan, you can think, and the loans are typically paid um, over a fixed schedule of payments. Uh, again, I say typically because there are some variations on that. But when you hear closed in credit or installment credit, you should basically think of a traditional auto loan or a mortgage loan, whether that comes from the auto dealer or from your bank. They, they, they tend to come in this closed in form. That is, it's a fixed dollar amount they're lending you for a fixed period of time. Now, what's open in credit? Open in credit are basically um, you can use the credit as you want, as you need, until you hit the maximum, and it's called the line of credit, and that'll be the maximum amount. Most credit cards um, that you will have will have a maximum amount, and so it might be that your bank will allow you to have a $2,000 a line of credit on your credit card. And you can purchase up till you hit that $2,000 maximum. And at that point, your credit card can't be used anymore. A credit card is called a revolving credit because it, it, it basically can be used over and over again each month. So that is you can uh, use your credit card to purchase things here in uh, January. And then in February, when time uh, comes around, you can use that credit line again. Um, 
Revolving credit uh, basically describes most credit cards you would have in most department store cards, like a Kohl's card, a Home Depot card, a Sears card. These are all revolving credit. They all work roughly in the same way. You pay an interest and finance charge to use the credit card if you do not pay the bill in full when it's due. So I want to emphasize that most credit cards, uh, the kinds I would encourage you to get, have no annual fee. At, at this point in your life, you should strive to get credit cards that have no annual fees. There are many no annual fee credit cards out there. You should avoid paying to use a credit card, especially when you can get a credit card for free. Um, if at some point as you get uh, older, uh, and uh, you're working for a firm and you're involved in a lot more expenditure, um, the credit cards that call have, a, have an annual fee often have better reward programs, but those really only make sense when you're charging a lot of money each and every month. And I think most college students don't fall into that category, and you'd really benefit from having the zero annual fee credit card. Um, and the only time then you're going to have a charge for using the credit card and it's super convenient is if you don't pay it off in full. And that is what many consumers fail to do. They don't pay it off in full. You need to resist the temptation. On campus, it's very common to find credit card companies in the student unions. Um, at uh, When you're uh, in the mall, when I'm at the airport, there are people offering me credit cards all the time. Um, I've learned just to say no. The average credit card holder in the United States has more than nine credit cards. Um, and that just creates a temptation to use the credit cards. That's too many credit cards in my opinion. Um, you need to decide whether you're going to view the credit card as a, as, as a convenience versus using a credit card as a way of borrowing money. I view a credit card as an attractive option because it's convenient for me to use. I do not view a credit card as attractive to borrow money. The finance charges is the total amount that you pay to use a credit card, and it's often hard for consumers to understand how hard, or how high, excuse me, these finance charges are. One thing that the credit card companies are extremely, they're, they're, they're very sophisticated in that they lure consumers in with really low teaser rates. So for the first year or the first six months, you have either a 0% interest or a very low interest rate on your credit card debt. That's not the long-term rate. Credit card companies, as I mentioned, often have reward programs as a way in uh, to use a credit card. If you're using the credit card as a convenience, and that is just a way to um, conveniently put all of your expenses in a single, easily trackable card and then you upload it to mint.com which I referred to uh, a couple lectures ago or you need a budget YNAB um, it's super convenient but the reward programs are not worth it if you're paying interest okay you're losing money if you think a credit card is attractive because it's giving you cash back or giving you miles if you are paying the, the, the loan charges all right, a couple ideas about credit capacity. The book covers these ideas in a lot more detail. Let me just mention a couple. Um, uh, one thing you should think of is something that's called the debt payments to income ratio. So what you want to think of is the, is the, the, the payments for these, in, these installment loans and these revolving credit loans. Um, add those up and divide it by your net monthly income. So take away your taxes that are paid, okay? Um, if your consumer credit payments exceed 20%, um, that is uh, too high, okay? You need to have consumer credit payments uh, to become financially secure. You need to keep your consumer credit payments to fall below 20% of your net income. Let me emphasize that when I talk about monthly debt payments, I'm not including your house payment. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of more like car payments and your credit card payments. Um, 
Okay. Um, another measure of credit capacity is something called debt to equity. And that would be you add up all your liabilities. So add up everything that you owe money on. So for you, it might be right now student loans. It could be outstanding credit card payments. And it could be a car loan. Okay, add up all your liabilities and divide it by your net worth. So you're going to have to take some time, which we discussed a few um, chapters ago about thinking about how to add calculated net worth. The debt to equity ratio needs to be less than one. Obviously, you should not have more liabilities than net worth. And there's a period of time in your life that you could have liabilities greater than net worth. That's probably true for many of you right now. When you get a job over the first year or two, you do need to aggressively work in terms of savings to move your debt to equity ratio to be less than one. All right. So let me talk about two related concepts here. And one is when you use credit cards, when you purchase things, you're creating a record of not only what you're purchasing, but whether or not you pay it off responsibly. I like to think of credit card companies as Google before Google. You know, there's a lot of, of uh, people who are concerned about Google and to some extent Apple or Microsoft knowing everything about us. Well, the credit card companies way before Google knew everything about us. The credit card company's business is to know what our business is. So um, there are these three major companies in the United States, Experion, TransUnion, and Equifax, which are in the business of collecting information about individuals. They, they collect information on what you purchase. They collect information on whether you are a timely bill payer. This is not just credit card. This is also utility bills. This is if you... Um, have a mortgage. This might be depending upon who your home, your, if you're renting your house, whether or not you're paying your rent on time. These credit agencies, their goal is to, to know as much about you as they possibly can. These, they also collect information often about your employment status. Um, their, their goal is to try to understand whether you are a good credit risk. Now, one thing you need to know is Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax, they're very, very similar in the information they collect. They're not exactly the same. They also make mistakes. Okay, They may think you have a credit card for some reason that uh, you actually don't have, or they think you never paid off some loan. You, in fact, paid it off. What you need to do is go to www.annualcreditreport.com. Ignore all the other ads that you hear, see on the internet, television, or radio. Annualcreditreport.com is the sanctioned place that gives you free credit reports. Okay, You are entitled to a free credit report from each of the three companies each year. So you're entitled to one from Experian, one from TransUnion, and one from Equifax. Do not pay for credit reports, okay? There are places on the internet that want to charge you $19.95 or $24.95 for a credit report. They are taking advantage of lack of knowledge. Go to annualcreditreport.com, create an account, okay? And then I would ask for a credit report from Experian. See what they think you have in terms of credit cards. And then uh, uh, they may, for instance, think you still have, let's just say, an old Sears card, which you canceled. Then the book describes how you go about, and also annualcreditreport.com also describes how you, you interact to tell these companies they have information that's incorrect about you. Uh, I would advise you not to get all three credit reports at the same time. I think it's more sensible to think that you're going to get an Experian credit report, let's just say in March. If you see activity or credit cards that don't belong to you, that might mean that someone is taking credit cards out in your name that don't belong to you. Let's hope nothing happens. Then wait three or four months. It only takes five minutes to do this on the annual credit report, especially once you have your account created. Then do a transunion credit report request. And they'll give you their information. And that, again, these three are very, very similar. You will see in, say, three or four months whether any kind of new activity and whether TransUnion has got a correct information or whether they're showing 
debits and credits that don't belong to you. And then wait three or four months and then do Equifax. If you rotate these three companies about every three or four months, you will kind of constantly be getting an updated credit report. You're entitled to one from each company per 12 months. And so if you spread them out kind of every three or four months, you would be getting a free credit report. Very important for your financial security to keep track of a credit report because as all you have to do is read the news to know that fraudulent uh, credit card activity is a huge business, uh, not just in the United States, but often from um, uh, places abroad. And if someone's taking out a credit card in your name, uh, your credit will be ruined or certainly severely damaged. You need to keep track of that. It's free. It's very, very uh, quick to do this. I encourage you to do it. Now, the credit report is just a report. You're going to get a long, effectively, printout. And it just says you've had your Sears card since this date and da-da-da-da-da. It just provides information about all the information they have on you. Okay. A credit report is not a credit score. A credit score, in some ways, is a numerical index that, that basically looks at your credit report and, and convert it to an index. This is really an important thing for banks who want to lend you money or credit card companies who want to offer you credit cards. The higher the score you get, and this is called the, your FICO score, the better you are as a person to they view as a person to lend money. Your goal is to have a really high FICO score because a, high, a higher score means you're less risk and you're going to get better offers. And what does better offers mean? You're going to get lower interest rate loans for your house, for your cars. You're going to get better credit card offers. Okay. So if you have a low FICO score, you get really high interest rates on everything. And again, you might not know that, but it, trust me, if you have a if you have a bad FICO score, a bad FICO score is a low number, then you're getting really poor rates. You can look at your credit score, not credit report, at myfico.com. The problem with myfico.com, it is actually an awesome website, terrific website. You could spend an hour just reading. They have tons of fantastic information on their website. But if you want a credit score, they charge a fee for it. Okay, it's My advice to you is go read the myfico.com website, but then get your free credit score. Go to creditkarma.com. That I've used it. It gives you a free credit score. It they approximate. They're not FICO. And FICO is definitely the industry standard FICO uh, credit card score. But Credit Karma is tapping into the same information, and they've emulated the MyFICO algorithm for computing credit score. So when I went to Credit Karma, I got my credit score for free. I didn't pay $19.95 for my my credit card from FICO, but I got something that's probably very, very close. And, and I would advise you to do that in this class. Like, go check out your credit score. See what it is here right now. And for many of you, um, uh, it, it's just something you need you need to know, okay? Um, now, the reason why it matters um, is that, as you can see here on this scale, if you have low numbers, and so low really means, in all honesty, surely below 600, probably below 650. Between 600 and 650 is kind of a gray area. If you are 650 and below, you're getting to be what the banks are going to consider you high risk, and you're going to get high credit interest cards. Okay, it's not attractive. You, in fact, will not be able to qualify for a home mortgage if you're surely below 600. And, and some banks won't give you a home mortgage if you're below 620 on your FICO score. So your goal is to have FICO scores in the above 650 and preferably in the 700 or even in the 800 range. You want to move to the low risk category. And the only way you can do this is by having a credit card credit cards and paying them off every month, paying your utility bill every month, okay? That's the way to, to get a high FICO score. And it really matters. I want you to, to re go to the My FICO site. They have tons of information about how your FICO score matters. And the bottom line is, is it converts to thousands and thousands of dollars by having 
uh, a high FICO score versus a low high FICO score. And you might feel like, wait a second, Professor Prusha, I, I don't see, I'm not paying for anything. You, in fact, are. You don't realize when you go try to get a loan, whether it's a car loan, a house loan, or get a new credit card, they're going to my FICO, they're getting your FICO score, and then they're telling you what interest rate they're going to offer you. You don't realize you're being checked whenever you're seeking to get any kind of either revolving credit or installment credit. And these higher scores mean they give you a higher interest rate. Let me give you an example here. I went to a website that 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 computes auto loan, right? So right now in your life, probably auto loans are more, more likely important to you than house loans. Autoloancalculator.com. Um, I, I just went in and I typed in two examples. I, I, I assumed you're going to go get a car for $20,000 and a five-year car loan. If you have a good credit score, you're going to get, let's just say, a 5% car loan. Um, if you have a bad credit card, if you can get 7%, that's great. Actually, I think you're likely to even pay higher than 7%. Your monthly payment is about $20 a month more. Okay, um, and that means, okay, you say, Professor Prusha, you said thousands, but over the course of your five-year auto loan, you'll pay over $1,100 more because of this credit score you didn't even know you had that was that was poor, okay? So on your car loan, uh, you will pay um, a big chunk more about, to give you perspective, that's about 50% more interest, not quite 50%, right? You're paying $2,600 in interest in one case, and you're paying $3,700 in the next. That's a big, big difference in how much interest you're paying. It's even The effect's magnified even more on a house loan. Now here, let's imagine you're going to get a 30-year house loan, and it's a $300,000 house. That would be a typical price in New Jersey. Okay, with a good credit score, you'll I I, I imagine just uh, for example, it's four and a half percent. The MyFICO website suggests that your poor credit score could be way higher than six percent. You could be paying eight or nine percent easy for the same mortgage. Okay, three hundred thousand dollar mortgage, um, but it's because they perceive you to have a uh, uh, poor credit score as a, a low FICO score. Your monthly payment, it, uh, if you have a poor score, would be almost $1,800 a month versus $1,500 a month. Your total interest paid on this home mortgage will be $350,000, okay, versus $250,000 with the good credit score. And that's a difference of total payments for the $300,000 house of $650,000 with your bad credit score versus 550,000 with a good credit score that's a difference of over $100,000 that's real money that's all driven by your fico score good credit score now think about for a second that's $278.59 each month you pay more for your home. And let's imagine that instead of paying that to the bank for your uh, credit score, for your mortgage because you have a poor credit score, you will take that money and invest it at 6% interest and save that money so, towards your retirement account. That means in addition to owning your home in 30 years, you'd have that $278 invested each month over 30 years would be worth $281,000 in 30 years. That's your future value. That's a huge amount. So that's some highlights from Chapter 5, and this is... Um, uh, a chapter I feel very strongly about because you're, it's totally within your control to get a high high credit score, and that is a, a very important way to generate wealth because money that you would otherwise have to pay the bank, you can keep yourself. Good luck with the rest of Chapter 5.